This week at the agenda saw a government toying with the liberalization of the LCBO, the modern notion of rich and poor, and the environmental and economic costs of alternative energies. The Agenda's Week in Review begins, though, with a look at Ontario Liberal MPP Kathleen Wynne's leadership potential. This is the part of the interview where I say, here's what I'm hearing. Because <laughs> I'm out there, you know, I'm out yeah. there and I'm attending stuff and talking to people, and here's what I'm hearing. Kathleen Wynne is terrific, great integrity, knows her brief. She knows so much about so many different levers in the government, brings people together. However, has never been in opposition. We have a minority parliament right now, which is fractious. We may need somebody who's got an outward appearance of being more aggressive and tougher in the premier's chair in order to deal with the opposition, and that's Pupatello, it's not her. What's your response to that? So let me just tackle the first part, the opposition part, and then I'll come to the what's needed. Um, I think if you ask some of the members of Mike Harris's cabinet and government whether I know how to act in opposition, they would probably say, Indeed, she does. I wasn't in the legislature, that's absolutely true. I was a public school trustee, I was a community activist, but my skills at uh, opposing and clarifying issues and making sure that people understand where I stand and where we differ are, are pretty finely tuned. Um, and you know, I've demonstrated that I can win elections. So that's, that, from my perspective, that's not an issue for me. I believe that I can build a team and we can, uh, we can launch a very, a very strong uh, campaign. And, and we'll do that if necessary. But to the second part of your question, I'm not sure that that's what's needed right now. I think what's needed right now is someone who's going to be able to work with the opposition, someone who's going to be able to reach across the floor and say, look, we had an election a year and a bit ago, and we need to govern now. The people of Ontario have asked us as a minority government to work together and govern. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. But if we have to, if we have to go into an election, I'm ready to do that, absolutely. Some people have said to me, if we vote for Sandra Pupotello as leader, we get Kathleen Wynne too, because she'll stick around and they'll be a good team. If we vote for Kathleen Wynne for leader, we don't necessarily get Pupotello because she probably won't come back from private life where she, she is right now and she won't come back into public life. Pupotello, we get two. Wynne, we only get one. Well, I, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard Sandra say whether she is going to run or not. I guess I assumed that she would run for office, uh, well, she, she, whether she is the leader or not. She, I asked her about it, and she gave me a bit of a... Well, I'll tell you what she said. What she said was, I can't commit 100% to coming back because whoever wins, the new leader would have to sign my nomination papers, and I don't know if the new leader would, would want me back or welcome me back, so I can't commit. Uh, I'll, I'll sign Sandra's nomination papers. You'll sign the papers. papers. Absolutely. Okay, so that Absolutely. excuse is off the table. Happy, happy to have her. You know, it would be great to have Sandra as part of my team. Absolutely. And I'm happy to sign her nomination papers and happy to find the rest of the people that she needs to sign the nomination papers. What about the other, though? That if she decides not to come back, you get both if you get her, you get one if you get you. Well, you know, people have to make that decision, Steve. The members of the party have to make that decision. They have to, to decide what is needed right now. And I've put myself forward as someone who's got experience. I've got the energy and the enthusiasm. And, you know, I understand, I understand how to win, and I understand how to collaborate and work together. So that's the skill set that I have, and I hope, that, I hope that will be seen by the party and that I'll have an opportunity to lead. Is she a riskier choice because she doesn't have a seat in the legislature and therefore if she stays true to what she said, she doesn't want to bring the House back until she has a seat. So that wouldn't be the day after Family Day. That would be presumably later, maybe March. Who knows? Is that a problem for her? So I'm not going to pass judgment on Sandra or, or her situation. Pass judgment. I'm not, not? I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to say, and you can, you, can ex you can extrapolate from what I say, I think we need to get back to the legislature right away. Uh, I think the fact that I have a seat is an advantage. I think it's important to get back to the legislature. No one's comfortable with prorogation. You know, the reality is that uh, we've lost 18 days in the House. It's enough. We need to get back, and we need to get at it. So I think that February 19th is a date we need to go back. Have you or any of your people had any conversations, either officially or unofficially, I'm trying to cover every base here in asking this question, <laughs> with anyone on the NDP side of the equation on how your parties could work together if you win once the House is back? No. 
Really? No. Nothing. To, to, the, to the best of, now, there are a lot of people working on my campaign, so I can't vouch for every single conversation that every single member of my team has had. But I can tell you that I have had none of those conversations. My senior team has had none of those conversations. And, you know, I think that there have been signals sent in public, certainly by me, to both leaders of the opposition that I want to work with them. But beyond that, there haven't been any private conversations that I'm aware of. Because people are, I think, entitled to know whether or not you are considering a variety of options for working with one of the other two opposition parties, such as a possible coalition, such as a possible formally written out accord, such as a, I don't know, we'll go bill by bill and just see how we go. Where's your thinking on that? So, honestly, I haven't talked about coalition. That's something that has come at me from, uh, from the media. I haven't heard anybody else talking about coalition. But what I am clear about is that it is going to be up to me and to Tim Hudak and to Andrea Horvath to have a conversation about how we can or cannot work together. I'm willing to work with one or both of them. Um, but the, the nature of that conversation and what it will lead to has got to be He's got to be with all of us. It's not for me to say, this is what I want to do, you know? This is, this is how I see it. That's not the kind of leadership that I bring. It's not the kind of leader that I am. I, I want us to work collaboratively, and I want us to co-create whatever that, uh, that go-forward position is going to be. Is there a way to change the way the LCBO does business while at the same time realize that $1.6 billion of annual revenues that the Treasury needs? I think it's an ongoing evolutionary process. That's why we see the announcement that we made uh, just a couple of weeks ago with respect to those two new options. Uh, the LCBO is a world-class organization and it's constantly working with government and stakeholders and people out there in the broader community to make sure that it's refining how it does business. But to Martin's point, it makes no sense whatsoever to sell something that's, uh, that's going to cost taxpayers that revenue that comes in. Uh, that's revenue that we take and we invest in crucial areas like health care, education, and, and in, in infrastructure so investments. So you couldn't sell the LCBO and still realize the same amount of revenue? Well, it doesn't make sense. In the past, we've seen other governments of a conservative stripe in particular sell off other really crucial public assets. Highway 407 is a good example. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a situation, an example that we, we continue to uh, have a bit of a hangover okay. effect with respect to. Give us an example here, Peter Sherman, of how you could sell the LCBO to private interests and still realize a billion six to the Treasury every year. You could decide, for example, that you're going to retain the wholesale division of the LCBO and you're going to franchise stores on the retail level. Look, here's the thing that Stephen and Dwight Duncan and the Liberal government won't admit. They have a study that says that if they went ahead with plans along these lines, they could net at least $200 million more dollars, probably more than $200 million. The, but you have a study, you have a study, and we have a copy who, of it. Who did it? The, I can't tell you who did it off the top of my head, but I, but I have a copy of the study, and I can supply that information. This is the, the bottom line, I believe you're talking about. It is, it is from 05. Yeah. The bottom line on this Which was is the government. Right you know what? You had your turn. Why okay, don't you okay. be quiet and let me finish? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let's okay? Go. The, the bottom line is that governments do not derive revenues by owning businesses, they derive revenues by taxing businesses and by generating economic activity and by creating economic activity that creates jobs. People pay taxes, stores pay taxes, that kind of thing. We saw what happened when the Conservatives tried to divest Ontario Hydro. We saw what happened with that very failed experiment and electricity rates going up and everything turned into a mess. Is that what the people of Ontario want with their liquor control board? I don't think so. I think people are generally very happy. Oh yes, they're, they're, you know, you're going to get the odd crank who's going to say that this doesn't work or they'd rather go down to the corner store. But, but you know, when you go into a store in Ontario, I'm telling you, I think that the stores are modern, they're convenient, Convenient. They have knowledgeable staff, and I really believe that in terms of, of the way it's, it's run, it stops drunks and kids and but people from buying the buying the boot. Well, no, is, I, 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 th I think it is part of the point. The point. It is part of the point that the people of Ontario want and accept. I'm waiting to get into the beer store argument because I think Hold it might be slightly, there, yeah. it might yeah. be slightly, slightly different. Yeah. But I think the LCBO does a great job. The world's largest importer of spirits and wine and, and, and knowledgeable and, and uh, if, if they could just get their pricing right at the top end so that we didn't have to pay more than what the wholesale price, that's, that's the only thing that I would really want to see change. MRC. Can I try to be helpful on a couple of points here? First of all, I, I think the $200 million that Mr. Sherman is talking about, 
I might be wrong here, but off the top of my head, I believe that was the suggestion that that's what the government would lose, uh, not gain, by privatizing. It's gain. Uh, so, uh, but it's, not, but it's not what I will say to help everybody here is it's not $1.6 billion that's at stake. We're not going to lose $1.6 billion by privatizing. Let's agree tonight, uh, without our notes in front of us, that we're talking about plus or minus $200 million. Okay, so it's not the end of the world. However, it is an enormous amount of cash flow. And I would argue that as a monopoly that, per, that distributes at a big scale with huge economies of scale, when you break up that monopoly, you will lose some of that profit, some of those efficiencies, and some of, some of, the, some of what you have. Shall we talk about the beer store, which has been your, one I'll of your that. favorite He's, hobby horses? Well, that has to come out somewhere. Right? <laughs> you, you have been writing the nastiest columns about the, uh, the, what they call the beer store now, what we used to call brewer's retail back in the day. What's the problem? Someone had to say it. Uh, look, I, I think if I... Here's one suggestion I would give Mr. Sherman and Mr. Hudak. They held a photo op for their announcement about privatizing the LCBO and the beer store outside of an LCBO outlet. They should have held it outside of a beer store How because come? that's where the public discontent is at its highest. It also would have helped to remove some of the confusion because a lot of people were thinking that the Tories would privatize the beer store. It's already privately held. It's owned held. by the private brewers. It's owned that's by right. a monopoly of three of the biggest foreign owned brewers. And people don't realize that. They, they, they're used to the idea of the beer store being looking and feeling like an old Stalinist government-run institution from the 1950s but or presumably 40s. presumably this is for convenience sake, right? It's easier well, to distribute booze, if you can, beer, if you can do it all to the stores that they already own. That was the thinking in 1927 or 8 after Prohibition. And the, the, the LCBO got the heavy stuff and the, beer, the breweries across the province got the less uh, intoxicating stuff. And they were wholesalers at that point. In the 1940s, they bought out the retailers and became vertically integrated. Then the beer, store, the beer industry itself rationalized and you had three big breweries. And then they were globalized and became three foreign-owned breweries. That's crazy. Why are three foreign-owned breweries dictating the terms of sale in this province so amongst the happen? beer stores? We should allow for competition. Uh, the, the beer stores in Ontario number around 1,400, 1,500. They are as... Uh, Martin points out, uh, privately operated, so we have no particular say there as a government in waiting other than we can free people up to sell beer somewhere else. Uh, if you go to Quebec, uh, which I did recently, there are about 10 times that number of outlets, 16,000, and it is in the food stores everywhere. And you know what? The social responsibility piece, I took a look at the figures on uh, deaths in traffic, alcohol-related per 100,000 population. They're about the same in Quebec as they are in the province of Ontario. What is wrong with the responsibility of people in Ontario that they can't go to a supermarket or a corner store and buy beer? And what is wrong with putting in the hands of those corner stores the sale of beer? If we can do it rurally, we can do it in an urban way. So distribution and choice Choice and treating people like adults is fair. Where are the Liberals on this? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is that what we've experienced over the last little while is that consumers, like myself, like my wife, when we want beer, we tend to buy our beer at the LCBO. And consumers are actually voting with their feet on this. Uh, in my constituency, in Vaughan, uh, for the most part, the beer stores and the LCBOs are in the, actually in the same plazas. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of people that are, are, are opting to choose uh, buying their beer at the LCBO, perhaps because the customer experience is better for them. But because the beer store is a privately run operation, it'll be up to them, as any other privately operation, to determine whether they can do better with that customer experience and compete. They are losing business to the LCBO and beer stores. I think they would admit, it, admit if asked. So uh, and also, the, 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 um, the announcement that we made just a couple of days ago around the, the additional options for buying, uh, the express outlets that we're going to be adding to some supermarkets and some other venues over the next 12 to 18 months will include the sale of beer, <clears throat> which will help with some of the access. You would not open it as much as Martin Redcon would suggest? Well, I think it's an ongoing, ev ev again, evolutionary process. The, the LCBO is going to take a look at the, uh, these two new options over the next 12 to 18 months and beyond, see how it plays out. This is a bit of a pilot run that we're doing. Uh, and if it seems that it's working well, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll continue to evolve that way. Michael Pru, what's well, your position? Uh, first of all, the pilot run's fine by me, but I think it's way too slow. And, and I think if we want, to, we want to get to this, we have to understand that the, uh, the beer store uh, is run by three companies and that they put their beer out in the front where you can see it most easily. If you go into most of the beer stores, they're pretty grubby. 
I mean, they're not very nice places to shop. You know, and you've got a beer bottle, perhaps an empty one, or, or just a label, on, and you're trying to figure out, and you can't read it. I mean, when you go to buy wine, you can read the year it's from, the region it's from, the types of grapes that are in it. You can read all that. You can't do that with a beer bottle. You don't know what kind of percent alcohol. You don't know anything. And so I think it needs to change. And if they're not willing to change, then we have to find some, some other way. And I especially think this is true of craft breweries, because that's the real exciting place to my mind where the beer you know the, the big three can continue to sell their stuff in the beer store if they want but I think the craft breweries have to be you know given the opportunity uh, to show Ontarians what really good beer is all about you ready to talk some politics now sure here's what I hear about you I'm out there I talk to liberals I want to find out what they think about you and to a person they all say Charles Sousa good guy decent guy solid guy He's been in politics less than five years. He's got no profile at all. Are they right about that? I have been in politics for five years. And yeah, I'm not a career politician, but I am a politician because I've been doing it now for five years. And I believe it's necessary for us to have a new face. Well, you know, a little renewal. We're talking about party renewal. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. And I have some ideas that I think are important. And these aren't just my ideas. These are ideas that I've, I, I've obtained as a result of being out there with a number of community members all across this great province and uh, I have 25 years in the private sector so I understand a little bit about how that works too I've helped many businesses in, in my career get started I think we have to attract some of that expertise someone who has some economic background but also has a working background in, norm, in terms of getting it done. Uh, your government, uh, we don't know what the final price tag is, but you've spent upwards of $200 million at least to cancel the power plant that was going to go in Mississauga. It's being moved to Sarnia. And uh, liberals tell me when we talk about it, I can't vote for a guy who every time I look at him reminds me of how much money we blew trying to save his seat in the last election. What do you say to that? Well, I have fought for the community, and it's, this wasn't in my writing, by the way, it was outside my writing. I opposed the siting of that plant seven years ago. I opposed it still when I was running, and I opposed it when I uh, was elected. I opposed it when I became minister, and I still oppose it when I saw it re-election, saying it was poorly sited, it's in the wrong location. It's a stone's throw away from homes, literally. And I, wa and I, would, and I fought to protect the community as I, was fight, as, I was, as I would fight to protect Ontario. Um, as, as Premier, I wouldn't have allowed it to be cited in the first place. We have to take into consideration uh, the community issues. Uh, we have to take, put in legislation that allows for a proper displacement and location of these, uh, of these plants. And, and I didn't just fight it for the sake of fighting it. I brought forward solutions. I offered alternatives where we had welcoming communities where we had individuals citing uh, areas that wanted to do more cogeneration to attract that investment. Okay. You, you opposed it, but you didn't resign in cabinet. You didn't resign from cabinet over it, right? Oh, I opposed it even before I was elected because my point was I wanted to ensure that we protect the interests of all uh, of the communities and all Ontarians at the same time. But it, it, I guess the question at the end of the day is, is that a, for lack of a better expression, a branding problem for you insofar as if people look at you and think, Mississauga gas plant cancellation rather than Quebec City to Windsor Corridor, new trains, multi-billions of dollars in investment. Is that a problem for you? I think what people want is someone's going to stand up for the uh, interests of the community as well as the interests of Ontario and look at being positive and, and forward thinking. Had we done some of the issues that I was proposing initially, see for me we're not cancelling the plant, we're moving it. That's what I was proposing all along. In fact, the opposition stood up the very next day saying, oh, no, 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 we'll cancel the power plant. He, they came in with buses and pink elephants, and they made a big show about the fact that they're going to cancel the power plant. And I just smiled, because you can't cancel the plant. You have to move it, because that's the, pro that's the proponent had won the contract. And they agreed to the changes that we proposed. So that's what should have been done many years ago, as I had suggested. Um, I want to know what your road to victory is, because as we know, Anything can happen, and just about anything can happen at a delegated convention. You know, we know who's up, we know, who, we know who's in the top of the pack, we know who's in the middle of the pack. As you look at your strategy and your road to victory, what is it? Well, I... Uh, I mean, at convention day, at the gardens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
this, is, this has not been won by anyone, right? This is still a, a, an open field. And uh, uh, there's a third option. And I, and I still see the possibility of uh, enabling and impressing upon the delegates that if we're going to have positive and, 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 and we want to talk about party renewal as well as renewing the province and direction it's going, let's look at and have those discussions still. And uh, for me, that possibility still exists. But as you talk to your troops, I mean, presumably they have an interest in your thinking on this. Where's Charles Souza's road to victory? How does it happen actually on the Saturday at the convention at Maple Leaf Gardens? Well, it's going to happen throughout the coming weeks as we have discussions with delegates. So right now, there's a lot of ex officios, right? There's a number of people who are independent. Uh, and there are a, a number of uh, uh, camps who are going to look elsewhere if necessary. Those are alternatives that still provide for growth in this convention. And uh, I uh, have made it very clear as of last night that we're going to the convention. We have a dynamic and vibrant team of individuals with great ideas. Uh, together, they've given me a lot of strength. And I'm encouraged by the discussions and the debates that have been had. And more importantly, I'm encouraged by uh, the, the attention by even the broader public. Steve, for me and for most Ontarians, they don't care if you're red or blue, orange or purple. What they care about is what are you going to do to improve my lot in life? How are you going to help my kids have a better start? What are you going to do to ensure that I have good jobs so that I can afford the things that matter? Like health care. And can you work with me to make that so? And that's what I'm talking about, and that's why I'm running as Premier. Most people would consider someone earning $250,000 a year wealthy. But what if that person doesn't feel rich? Since the beginning of the economic downturn, we've seen an increased use of the words rich and poor, and we're told repeatedly that the well-off aren't always contributing their fair share. But what does being rich really mean? Richard Wilkinson, why don't you start? What annual income makes you rich today? Well, it's not a matter of your absolute income. It's how it compares with other people in your society. So if you lived in a much poorer country, uh, people who are less well-off than some in the States would be rich. Uh, we'd call them rich even though in, if they lived in the States, we wouldn't call them rich. Uh, what does the damage in a society is the scale of income differences uh, between people who are better off and worse off. Catherine Rampell, I saw some numbers on your uh, blog where some polling was done. People were asked, what do they think rich is? What did you find out? I mean, I think rich is making 50000 or or 100000 more than you make, basically. It's sort of a sliding scale. Everyone seems to think that they are middle class, um, that they are the, the median earner, even if they're actually at the 95th percentile, and people who make more than they do are rich. And this shows up in poll after poll. Uh, there was one Gallup study, for example, where people were asked, should people earning 250000 excuse me, they asked people, should upper income people earn uh, or pay higher tax rates and most people said yes higher income people should be should be paying higher tax rates um, and when they asked people who earned over two hundred fifty thousand dollars who are at you know about the 95th percentile should upper income people earn, pay higher tax rates they said yes but if but when they said should you pay higher tax rates they said no <laughs> so a lot of it has to do with uh, this sort of skewed perception of where each American falls within the overall income distribution. Michael Cox, when Gallup surveyed it, at least the last Gallup survey I saw, uh, the, the, the majority of people said it was about $150,000 a year, which made you rich. That would put you in the top 10% of income owners, as opposed to what society talks a lot about these days, which is the top 1%. Where do you peg it at? I don't peg it at any particular number. I don't think it's relative. I think it should be judged absolute. For example, in the year 1984, this device cost $4,200 and was only affordable by the society's richest people. Today, this device is routinely consumed by some, some of society's poorest people, yet we call them poor when they ought to be judged as being rich by the standard of the progress we're able to make. You are what you spend, you are what you can consume, and what the data I've looked at, in fact, it, the data we published it in the New York Times in an article called You Are What You Spend, what it shows is that rich people 
only spend, they, they may make 14 times as much as poor people on a relative basis, but they only spend about three times as much because they pay heavy taxes, they contribute to charity, they, have, they pay for their kids' college education, and they have many more things that they do with their money which don't ultimately convert to consumption. Paul Somerville in British Columbia, come on in here and tell us uh, where you are on this issue. Well, a couple of points. I, I think the first is, uh, like the other speakers, a kind of annual income point doesn't really tell you very much about wealth. When I was uh, on the trading floor at RBC Dominion, we used to talk about three numbers uh, that you wanted to aim for, 3 million, 5 million, and 10 million. Uh, 10 million was a life of champagne and caviar if you were retired, 5 million uh, was wine and cheese if you retired, and 3 million uh, was beer and pretzels. So I think actually net worth uh, is a much more important uh, barometer uh, for being rich. But the second thing is, is that it's not just individual wealth, it's also societal wealth. You know, if you earn, say, $30,000 a year and you're a single mother, uh, but you have access to world-class health care, uh, university education is highly subsidized, uh, there's excellent public transit that you have access to, so your commute to work is, say, 25 minutes, then you may not be rich, but you're living a better lifestyle than someone who earns the same amount of money but doesn't have access to the science of good health, uh, where uh, post-secondary education is very expensive and where public transit is lousy. So I, I, would, I would put it in those rounder terms. Joseph, you're the guy from the Center for Ethics, so I got a feeling I'm going to have a hard time getting a number out of you as well. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the blog post that you read from, I think what it reveals is a really important point, which is that there's obviously a big difference between being rich and feeling rich. Because anybody who's in the top 1% income bracket in their society, by any objective measure, is rich. That the term is meaningless if the top 1% are not rich. So clearly he is rich, but he doesn't feel rich. Right? And there's an interesting question as to, as to why many of the wealthy don't feel wealthy. So, I mean, that was just a whole series of articles. I mean, there was a series of articles that came out after the, in the wake of the Occupy movement of basically people who are objectively rich saying, oh, hold on a minute, you know, look at all my expenses. My kids go to private school. I'm not really wealthy. Um, and I, I think actually there was a uh, Hamilton Nolan Gawker Media nailed it exactly. He said the fundamental dishonesty of all those articles was people were saying, you know, objectively, this salary looks like a lar large amount of money. But after I spend it, it's not very much. <laughs> Completely yeah. missing the point that like, like it's, it's, it's necessary that if you're earning the top 1%, after you've itemized all of your expenses, what you just rattled off are a whole list of things that 99% of people in your society can't afford. This is from Oxfam from just a few months ago. Oxfam writes, they warn that Europe's growing appetite for biofuels is pushing up global food prices and driving people off their land resulting in deeper hunger and malnutrition in poor countries. So I want to find out, can using farm crops raise the cost of food that people, particularly in poorer countries, need to eat? Excellent question. I mean, I've done an awful lot of research on this because I don't want to be in the business or devote my life to something that's going to starve people or is going to raise people's food prices. So it's very important that we understand this. And I'm only talk about ethanol, so I don't have uh, the other uh, fuels to, to discuss. But uh, and it's a inter very interesting question. Right now, we make our ethanol from uh, corn. It's not the corn that people eat, OK? It's either industrial corn or animal corn. It's known as a number two corn. And um, they, it's grown on, on farms that are huge, you know, either hundreds of acres or thousands of acre farms that a combine comes by and then takes the corn kernels off the corn. And um, what we do is only remove the carbohydrate and then return the balance of the food that's in that corn product to the animal feed market. Um, about 15 years ago, the industry, the corn uh, seed industry, developed what's called GMO products, okay? And therefore, they knew, and so did government. This is genetically that modified? Modified, that's right. Okay, and all corn, okay, is now genetically modified corn in North America. And they knew going back 15 years ago that the amount of corn that could be produced on the same amount of land would double or even go up more. So they tried to come up with uh, purposes for and uses for this additional corn because there wasn't, it wasn't needed in the food chain. So they came up with high fructose corn syrup, big user of corn, industrial corn, sweeteners, big use, and ethanol. And if you take a look at the number of animals that there are in the United States or in North America today compared to the number that there were 10 years ago, it's about the same. So if you had a doubling of the amount of corn on the same amount of land, which is corn land, where you can't grow mm. fruit and vegetables anyway, and you knew it was going to double, and now you have that not, uh, much corn, 
What would you do with it if you didn't make ethanol with it? Well, I mean, you can make canola, soybean, oat, barley, Not true. wheat. This is a rotation crop, all right? And you all have crops to are rotation So crops. therefore, you do rotate to soybean. It's the same land. You're right. absolutely right. You're rotating with these different products. But what are we short of? In other words, if you took out this, this amount of corn out of that uh, piece of land when it's being grown for corn purposes mm -hmm. and getting two or three times the amount of corn, the yield that mm -hmm. you got 10 years ago, right. what else would you grow that you need? And because I, we don't really need, we're not short of any food. The World uh, uh, Bank will tell you that. 40% mm -hmm. of almost all food grown in the world is wasted, which well, is the horrible. Re the, reason, the reason I take such concern with it, and this is not to be pugilistic in any way, shape, or form, is so much of what we do uh, not to make this sound like a sales pitch, but so much of what we do is predicated on, on a lot of other firms, and you happen to operate the largest in the country, ethanol. And I know a huge component of your business in the alcohol business. It's a great risk model, and, and we do the same thing to a certain degree in a much, much smaller scale. But I wonder where the next step is. Uh, is cellulosic possible? Are we going to have some sort of application for gasoline? Because people don't realize, reach out and touch diesel in Canada. We but don't can I just, feel in that. Let in me that understand your way. concern. What, what is your criticism as it relates to ethanol? I need. I, we need to get away from corn. I really do believe it. We need I to get really, away from corn. I think we need to get away from corn because I, 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 I don't believe that the food for fuel debate is a fallacy. I really think there is something to it. Okay, and I'm going to answer that. I, I believe we're moving to the cellulose ethanol model. All right, and our company, Greenfield, is one of the forefronters, for, front runners in the development of that cellulose ethanol product. So there you take corn cobs and stover and leaves and grasses and special energy crops and trees. But not the corn. And, and, and not corn, and you make ethanol from that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're doing that now at, at, a, at a small demonstration plant in Chatham, and there are now six commercial plants being built in the United States. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to answer you this way, John. There's going to be a lot of cellulose ethanol produced. There's going to be continued ethanol made from corn, probably at the same level you have now, because I'm going to say to you, there is all this corn that's coming out of the farm uh, community, and there's nothing else to do with it other than to make ethanol. It's not required for food, and it's not requ that it, land it, is, is not is required it, for anything it, else. And Stephanie. Is it produced by virtue of the ethanol industry? Was, was there not a natural evolution in that sort of organic way in the farming industry, and I'm a farmer myself, that where, we, where certain crops come in and out of vogue? by virtue of what consumers demand. And I mean, I see that myself. I, I hustle around Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, Ontario, to try and get folks to grow flax with us. And so I just wonder if there might be an inherent fallacy in the fact that we might have a glut of corn, but I think the glut was, was, was ultimately orchestrated by the ethanol industry okay. in its first Stephanie, place. Stephanie, weigh in on this? I think what you're talking about moving to cellulose is really focusing on waste again and, and that's a positive development because we do waste so much in our agriculture, in our forestry and it, we can take lessons from other jurisdictions and really turn that waste into usable material and I think that's the direction we need to go and we need to as a society sort of speak up against our waste potentially uh, change the, the economics because uh, it's always easier to dig a hole in the ground and extract energy for a very low cost, whereas these alternatives all cost more. And if we don't have a price on carbon, which is always, always puts us at a disadvantage, then uh, society needs to speak up and say we don't always want the fossil fuels. How about we have some level of incentive for the alternatives? And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website. You'll find that at theagenda.tvo.org or on our iTunes channel or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.